So today the stock market rallied 600 points on the Dow. Thanks, at least the mainstream financial media talking heads are crediting it to Jerome J. Powell's words about how he would slow down the rate hikes. But the mainstream financial media is forever pumping, continually pumping. I mean, I, I happened to watch some of the programming today, and it was it was very, very perma-bullish. Although there, they did have a small segment, I think, on CNBC yesterday. It was either yesterday or Monday. And there was an author on there. I'll talk about the article. It's in the Wall Street for Main Street Facebook group. The article is called, When Blue Chip Companies Pile on Debt, It's Time to Worry. So it's from the New York Times. It's an op-ed piece by someone who worked on Wall Street for many years by William D. Cohan, C-O-H-A-N. So check that out. It's in the, you could either Google search it or look it up in the Wall Street for Main Street Facebook fan page. But in general, the stock market, you know, despite the comments of Chairman Powell, I think the evidence is still clear. I haven't changed my mind on this yet, that there is still institutional money and smart money distributing stock or fading stock market rallies. So until I see different, totally different tape action from, you know, just a day or two rally on Fed chairman comments, my mind's not going to be changed. So the main reason, though, that I'm doing this live stream today, and I know it's late for you guys on the West, on, excuse me, on the East Coast in the United States, but I wanted to get my thoughts out there. I actually had planned to do this uh, earlier today and a couple days ago, but I was having some health problems. I don't want to go into it. But I've been doing research on General Electric, and I don't think GE is going to go bankrupt right, right away per se. So basically, they're kind of in the hands of the bankers right now because they have enormous amounts of debt, revolving credit facilities that the bankers can keep them going for a while. My buddy Charles Ortel, who's actually a brilliant value investor, he worked on Wall Street for a very long time as an investment banker and also private investor as well, a very successful guy. And he was warning about GE prior to the 2008 financial crisis. And as you guys know, Warren Buffett and Warren Buffett bailed out GE. There's been problems with GE Capital. Uh, Francine McKenna said in an interview, in the interview that I did with her last month, that GE has gotten many fines from the SEC and disclosed them in their annual reports and quarterly reports, but no one bothered to read them, unfortunately. So GE has had a lot of problems over the years, but traditional value investor people just saw it as kind of a boring dividend stock. But GE had been using financial engineering over forty billion dollars, B with a bill, B is in billion dollars worth of share buybacks at way higher stock prices than current stock prices. So basically, if you bought and held GE about twenty years ago, and you just rode the stock up and down for twenty years, now this is not counting like reinvesting dividends. You haven't done very much in terms of the capital gains. So. The stock hasn't done much, but if you have the dividends and you reinvested those and compound those, it's different. However, you know this is not a safe dividend stock anymore because of the financial engineering, the stuff they've done with uh, share buybacks, using debt, massive amounts of debt, over $100 billion in debt on the balance sheet. There may even be stuff off balance sheet. That's crazy. There's problems with GE Capital still. And from what I've heard, they even were trying to sell a pretty large portion of their pretty recent acquisition of the oil services company Baker Hughes, and they're willing to sell it at a, at a discount just for cash. So they had bought it only like two years ago, the, this oil company, and they were already willing to to sell it for, for immediate cash at a big discount compared to what they paid. And unfortunately, guys, uh, like I said, I've been doing research on this. I've read over a handful of articles looking into some of the problems with GE and also other corporate debt. There is more coming. I just cannot give you a timeline on in general. But so individual companies are easier to guess. With So there's companies like Campbell Soup and, uh, and 3M and McDonald's eventually will have problems with how much debt they put on their balance sheet unless they can grow revenues and earnings and free cash flow. There's also problems, you know, with companies like ExxonMobil. But more importantly, and this is something I really want to highlight from doing my research on GE and some of these other companies with the share buybacks with debt. By the way, I think by the end... Uh, over the next like six to 12 months, there will have been over $5 trillion in share buybacks in the last 10 years because central banks manipulated interest rates lower. So corporate America has done a massive amount of share buybacks thanks to artificially cheap debt. And also mergers and acquisitions, massive amounts of leveraged M&A. 
Okay, so the general overlying problems. It's it's not really one company specific, although you're going to eventually see companies go bankrupt or you're going to see companies need bailouts or you're going to see the rules change. This goes back to duplicity, um, who was complicit, who was rubber stamping it. Remember the 2008 financial crisis, right? What caused the mortgage-backed securities? Why did they blow up? They blew up because the investment bankers either bribed or threatened or whatever reason, maybe the bosses of these these uh, rubber stampers at Standard & Poor's, at Moody's, at Fitch, the ratings agencies, remember the rating agencies deserved an enormous amount of blame for the 2008 financial crisis. They rubber stamped subprime mortgage-backed securities as AAA, as investment grade, saying there was no risk there, okay? And I am telling you from the research I have just done, looking through GE and other problems with large corporations doing similar stuff, that the ratings agencies have done as bad or worse than the 2008. And I can't give you an exact date on when this whole thing will blow up, but I'm 100% sure that this problem will blow up again. That, well, it'll be a new bubble that will have blown up. So the ratings agencies, they are complicit. They deserve an enormous amount of blame. They should go bankrupt. These guys, these Standard & Poor's, Moody's, Fitch, and there may be a couple others, they kept GE's credit rating at AAA for way too long. For way too long. Okay, and I'll explain why. So I, I've been, like I said, researching researching GE and reading through value investors' comments, and there was a value investor that over a year ago predicted that GE would collapse. And he was talking about this. The guy had worked on Wall Street and in finance for a very long time, and he was blogging about it because no one in the mainstream financial media wanted to interview him or listen to what he had to say because, you know, it's painful. It means stocks are down. It means there's big problems. There's credit bubbles popping. People may lose their jobs, you know, that type of stuff. And so what he basically said is that the, the ratings agencies either chose to do it because they were collecting fees or they were pressured by, I don't know, investment banks or corporations, you know, relentlessly by the uh, CFO, chief financial, uh, chief financial officer, you know, those people pressured or bribed, God knows what, how corrupt everything is nowadays. And he basically said that instead of looking for like, you know, prudent amounts of debt based on like free cash flow or other things that now they basically gave these large corporations that used to have AAA credit ratings, they were allowed to borrow more and more debt for leveraged mergers and acquisitions or for share buybacks. And they were allowed to increase increase more and more debt, and they didn't get any credit downgrades. So they kept their AAA credit rating, which should not have happened. And there was a lot of false assumptions in a lot of these mergers and acquisition deals that never panned out. Enormously bullish false assumptions that they were sold or lied to or didn't care because they were collecting a fee. And so eventually, I don't know if it's five years from now, I don't know if it's 10 years from now, but because the ratings agencies rubber stamped and allowed these large corporations like General Electric and others to keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and borrowing more and more debt on AAA credit rating that they should not have borrowed, it's going to blow up. Okay, GE is just, I, I don't know the exact time frame on GE. I'd have to read through the annual reports. And anyway, GE is basically, even if you read through the financials, that's still an educated guess, obviously not financial advice, stupid disclaimer, that you, it's, it's like I said, it's in the hands of the bankers. So how quickly can GE sell assets? What kind of valuation can they get at some of these assets? I already said earlier that GE was willing to dump uh, a pretty quality oil services position, uh, oil services company that they had and sell it for less than half of what they paid only like 18 months later. So they didn't dump the whole company, but the portion of the company they sold for a couple billion dollars in cash was way below the valuation that they paid. So the rating agencies deserve, will deserve when this corporate bond, corporate debt bubble blows up. And in my opinion, a lot of these AAA rated 
and Jeff Gunlock, the famous Bond King and uh, value investor, has talked about this as well. That a lot of these AAA rated companies, the rating agencies, they're not really AAA. Okay, so these large cap, and I'm using blue chips in air quotes. These blue chip stocks, you know, the stocks, the consumer products that a lot of us grew up every day using. These CEOs to stay rich uh, or either get rich or get richer or, yeah, because most of them, most of the CEOs at these companies get hired from like Harvard MBA or Wharton. Some of them actually like start off at the bottom of the company and they work their way up. Very few of them, though, actually get to the CEO spot because normally like a lot of these blue chip stocks, they like hiring like really, really fancy, uh, you know, Ivy League MBA program types. But they have done massive amounts of financial engineering. And the other part is that I've been reading is that these credit rating agencies let these large corporations borrow, keep increasing either, either the debt in issuances or the more and more credit for, for share buybacks or mergers and acquisitions. They let them borrow against EBITDA, not earnings. EBITDA, which for those of you who are not familiar, is earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. That's not earnings. <laughs> okay? Okay, For unless you're a publicly traded company or a uh, Silicon Valley company using EBITDA multiples, which are kind of fictional. And Francine McKenna talked about this, that nowadays, even the definition that I just said of EBITDA might not even be a company's definition of EBITDA because they're trying to look for new ways to do creative accounting and cheat and accounting fraud. So the rating agencies, if, if you look at the mainstream financial media articles on the rating agencies, they're all talking about how good they're doing. <laughs> but... I, I, I don't know any timing on this. I don't know any timing on this for the rating agencies, but the rating agencies combined with the central banks, with the everything bubble, um, financial repression, and manipulating interest rates lower. So kind of basically what fueled the housing bubble also is has fueled, uh, after the 2008 financial crisis 10 years later, the corporate debt, corporate bond bubble. The rating agencies are complicit in this. They should be disbanded. They should lose their... They should lose their charters. They have some type of like um, oligopoly where there's only. It's very difficult to get if you're familiar with that business. Very difficult to get the charter for a ratings agency. Um, each corporate bonds are different, miser. Uh, I'll answer a listener Q and A later. I just wanted to go off on this this topic a little bit. So I don't know any timing on the on on when the crisis is, but now that GE is cracking and people are starting to panic, people are going to be looking more and more closely at some of these other large corporations similar to GE. GE had just been doing financial engineering for a, for a lot longer, and then their um, GE's cash flows, their revenues fell. So had GE actually maintained or grown revenues, they could have kept doing this for longer. GE got in trouble because they had all this debt and were growing debt, and then their revenues drastically fell. You have to go in there, Miser, you have to go in there if you want to look for individual companies, and this is not financial advice. I'm just telling you how to maybe do some research. If you're looking for companies to potentially shorter buy puts on, you'd have to go in there on your own and go look through the annual reports. And if you're lucky, you could probably see in the footnotes or some paragraph written by a lawyer talking about when the debt comes due and their payments and stuff. And there, make no, excuse me, make, it's it's late and I'm kind of tired. I just got back from the gym. So I, I apologize if my words are not always the best right now. But make no mistake, there will be hedge funds that will be doing, now that GE is cracking, that will be going through the balance sheets of Campbell Soup and others to go look for the next GE down the line one year, two year, three years from now. But in general, I think the stock market rally is still fading. Um, funny thing here, here's an interesting fact if it actually happens. So if the stock market closes up this year, this will be the first time in history, I think, that U.S. general stock markets have closed up 10 consecutive years. In past financial history, there's been a stock market crash every seven to nine years, okay? Almost like clockwork. Now, a lot of that is because of the central bank intervention 
since World War One, when the Federal Reserve was created, and it's caused you know cycles, central bank cycles and credit cycles and busts, booms and busts. But basically, if the stock market miraculously, for whatever reason, ends up closing higher this year in the United States, this will be the first time in history, 10 consecutive years in a row higher. Welcome to Dystopia. And that's why professional money managers, if that happens, are getting fired. Because almost anyone could have just bought an index fund 10 years ago and could have outperformed the brightest minds in finance, no matter how research how much research you've done. And you know what? I don't think that's gonna that trend's gonna hold much longer. I don't think passive investing and index fund investing is gonna continue to out, outperform the hardest working, most experienced, smartest minds in finance. So it's outperformed for a while, but I don't think that that's going to continue. Let's just put it that way. Okay, let me check my notes really quick. Yeah, yeah so basically, so basically you have situations now with the large corporations, these and I'm using air quotes, blue chip stocks where they have five times as much debt on their balance sheet as their EBITDA, not their earnings, as their EBITDA. And their definition of EBITDA might not be my definition, normal definitions of EBITDA. So basically then it's almost, EBITDA is a little bit better than just revenues, but it's almost like they have five times as much debt as their revenues. And normally... The credit rating agencies, if they were actually doing their job, would, would have downgraded a lot of these large corporations a lot faster. So they would have been downgraded from AAA to maybe a couple ticks below junk a lot longer. And instead, because these large corporations maintain their AAA credit rating, they would keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing, way over borrowing what they should have been doing with a AAA credit rating. If the regulators were honest, they should have downgraded them a long time ago and said, you know what, sir, if you're going to keep borrowing, we're lowering your credit rating. And I'm sure what happened is that they either, from the corporations, they either got threats or bribes or whatever. Or maybe even the boss at the, at the credit rating agency said, you know what, we have to because they're going to pay us a fee. Rubber stamp that shit. They're going to pay us a fee. They're going to pay us a fee. We'll, we'll, we're going to get sued when this blows up years from now. Maybe you and me are going to be retired. It doesn't matter. Uh, Wendell, I don't know how many more buybacks can happen. So we, we, there are more scheduled, but you know buybacks are going to eventually slow down, especially if interest rates do rise. So we'll see. But in General Electric's case, they did tons of buybacks, tens of billions of dollars in buybacks. And here we are 20 years later and the share price is down. So I would make the distinction for companies if they think their stock, they should not be doing share buybacks at all times in a cycle, no matter what stock valuation. That's the mistake these companies are doing. And it's the executives that are doing it. The executives are doing the buybacks in part to cover over the massive stock options that they're giving themselves to pay out. So they're getting rich quick and then using buybacks to, to soak up the share dilution. Another scam. Enormous problem with corporate governance in this country. I don't think we have time to cover that. Okay, so we're going to move on. I uh, think I've covered GE enough. If you have any other questions, you can put them in the live chat or in the comments section. Okay, so President Trump threatens to take away all of General Motors subsidies. As a libertarian, as a free market economist, I think this is great. No corporation, no industry should be getting subsidies, okay? For, sh for short periods of time, the subsidies may look to be helping, but over the long run, they end up normally creating misallocations of capital, waste, fraud, corruption, excess. And if you go back through U.S. financial history, I believe they ended up bankrupting the, a lot of the railroads. There was a big bust in the railroads after Congress did enormous uh, subsidies. Congress was picking out – Congress would – people in Congress – this is how corrupt the U.S. has been 
in a smaller scale, but at some points there would be congressmen that would know that there was going to be a railroad built somewhere and they would buy the land for cheap and then they would approve the railroad bill and give it a subsidy to be built there. And then they'd resell the land, you know, only a handful of years later for a lot more money. So the history of U.S. subsidies, also the sugar subsidy. The sugar subsidy for the sugar industry, it makes no sense. It will never get removed. I think it's been on the books for well over 100 years. It might even be on the books for over 200 years now here in the United States. Sugar producers in the United States do not need a sugar subsidy. So there's other uh, plenty of other industries that have gotten either tax breaks, certain types of preferential write-offs or subsidies. So for President Trump to say that General Motors, and you have people on the mainstream financial media complaining that President Trump shouldn't do that. Well, GM got a bailout, right? GM got over $11 billion in bailout money, right, during 2008. And GM, I, I already talked about this on a previous live stream recently, President Obama totally, first time in U.S. history, he totally screwed over bondholders, creditors. Okay, the creditors at GM, when they went bankrupt, should have taken control of the company, the assets, and gotten the equity. And instead, what, what President Obama did was he moved the United Auto Workers labor up ahead on the capital structure. It is, this had never happened before in U.S. history, and um, there was enormous backlash and lawsuits and others. He moved the United Auto, Auto Workers up ahead of the bondholders. The backlash was enormous. I think pension funds were threatening to sue because they were the largest shareholders at General Motors. So subs subsidies are a dangerous game. In the short term, they may help an industry. Look what happened with like corn ethanol companies. Those stocks went crazy. Look what happened temporary temporarily with solar here in the U.S. Solar City, Elon Musk. <laughs> And then he bailed out his cousins with shareholder capital too, billions of dollars of shareholder capital. Okay, moving on. Uh, Apple is down around 20% 20 since August 27, 2018. So we got a lot of the FANG stocks breaking down. The generals of technology, the generals of the stock market are breaking down. Now, I don't know if everything is crashing immediately, but we are seeing a lot of cracks. Restaurants and retail are actually holding up pretty good for the most part still, but we are seeing, you know, the oil market is down around 30%. The oil price is down around 30% in only a month. That's not normal. So we are seeing some big, big cracks. You know, the stuff that the mainstream media pump saying, look how good Apple's doing, look how good Facebook's doing, look how good Amazon's doing. That's why the stock market's going to go higher. The stuff the mainstream me financial media has been selling us for why the stock market should go higher, that stuff seems to no longer be working. And then you have, uh, even though the, there's not really any progress on the, the China trade war stuff, you still have Cocaine Larry Kudlow, the guy who, when he was on CNBC, I remember every single day in 2009 through, I, don't, I think he left like maybe 2013, his show ended or something. Every day he would pump and say, green shoots, king dollar, stock market's going higher, uh, U.S. is the best in the world. You know, no matter what, he's going to spin. But I don't know how much he can spin the China trade war stuff because Trump seems intent on that and uh, President Xi, Emperor Xi, cannot take the deal that Trump wants. So Trump says, <laughs> oh, Wendell, oh, man, you're funny, dude. Kudlow could be Elon's dad. <laughs> okay, I got to laugh at that later after the show's done. I don't think people want me laughing the whole show. Okay, so a couple more current events, and then we'll get to listener questions. Okay, so let me go here. So this is from the Washington Post. There's also stories on this elsewhere. Lawmakers consider multi-billion dollar bailout for troubled pensions retirees. 
Top lawmakers are considering a taxpayer-funded bailout for retirees who are members of certain failing pension plans, scrambling to solve a retirement crisis that threatens more than 1 million Americans. A draft of the plan, obtained by the Washington Post, would direct the Treasury Department to spend up to $3 billion annually to subsidize payments for retirees from certain underfunded pensions. It would also require benefit cuts, higher premiums, and new fees levied against companies and union members in an attempt to make the pensions as financially solvent as possible. The proposal aims to require all parties involved to make significant concessions and caps taxpayer contributions. Yeah, I'm calling bullshit on that. And only $3 billion per year in a, in a uh, pension fund bailout? Freaking cheapskates, man. <laughs> Freaking cheapskates. Only $3 billion per year? There was an article that came out last month that said I think the state, the city of New York, uh, New York City had, I think, $100 billion in, in unfunded liabilities for their, for their government employees, for their cops, their teachers, their firemen, that just the city of New York alone had an enormous, like, mind-boggling amount of, of unfunded liabilities for retirement money and also health care promises. That, that $3 billion has to just be the press release, right? I mean, the real number probably, we know Congress can't hold itself to a budget. We know the Fed has to keep printing, right? So eventually they're going to keep printing even more. Agreed, Robert, 2019 is going to be crazy. 2019 and 2020 are going to be be probably some of the, probably crazier than 2006 and seven. Maybe even crazier than 2008. Okay, let me cross out my notes here so we stay on point. We're at 20, we're around 26 minutes, so I'm doing a pretty good job covering the things I want to cover. Yeah, so the narrative that Larry Kudlow, President Trump, uh, the mainstream financial media that's trying to play up that the stock market is still going higher, that the real economy is doing well, is that people are still, the consumer is still happy, is still willing to spend more. So as soon as we see restaurants and retail break, that will probably be it. That's my best guess. Because the narrative now is that, oh, oil's down. Oh, that's good for consumers. You know, don't mind the oil jobs that could be lost. Or, oh, Apple's down. Oh, that's not that big a deal because the consumer is still, you know, going out to eat and buying other stuff. So as soon as that narrative in the U.S. changes that the consumer is not going out to eat, not using their credit card, not buying things on retail – that will probably be the last draw, at least from a narrative perspective, that's what they've set up. And if you look at stock market charts, like I said on the last live stream, the restaurants and retail, a lot of this, those stocks haven't broken down yet. Some of them were starting to crack, but most of them have not broken down. A lot of them have actually had really big rallies over the last 12 to 18 months. Cryptocurrency miners. So we're at, let me look up crypto prices real quick. So we're at 4186 Bitcoin when we're doing this live stream. So did you guys see that one of the largest Bitcoin miners in the United States that was in Washington state that was a darling of the industry only about a year ago, they just filed for bankruptcy last week. And if you go on the internet, there's actually tons and tons of video and pictures of Chinese Bitcoin miners either going bust or just totally shutting down. So we're having a big bust in crypto. This is definitely capitulation where the miners are going bust. We may go a little bit lower. Some of the cryptos are obviously not good. A lot of the altcoins are not good. I have a lot of the ICOs were fraud. But I think eventually some of the cryptos will survive. I don't know which ones. I'm pretty confident Bitcoin will survive, but we'll see. I mean, if the central banks are going to reverse and go to QE, like gold's going to go back up. Some of the commodities are going to go back up. And uh, Bitcoin will probably be popular. There's still a ton of millennials. I know, I know a lot of my listeners are older, but there's a lot of younger people that are in, looking at buying crypto again. 
that didn't buy it because it was too high maybe the first time during the move up. But now that it goes down, they may start to buy some. Again, not financial advice, stupid disclaimer. But if you don't own any Bitcoin, might be not a bad idea to buy a little bit here. It could go obviously lower, but if the miners are going bankrupt, you know, it's like it's kind of like gold. I mean, people said there there's I have experts on my show all the time that say gold can go down to any price. The stocks to flow ratio. Okay, when the supply for gold, the supply market, the physical supply market for gold is tight and the miners go bankrupt, we'll see if the paper price for gold actually goes down. Because the paper price for physical gold did not go down in 2008. It did not go like to Harry Dent levels of like 400. It didn't do that. It did go down. It did crash. But it didn't go to the levels that like Bob Prechter and Harry Dent were predicting. It went to the gold price dropped in 2008 to levels where some of the miners could still survive and produce gold. It did not go to a gold price where it bankrupted all the miners. And we're, we're almost at a, let me pull up the Kitco charts, uh, Kitco price real quick. We're at 1431 silver. I mean, we're almost, we're at 1223 gold and f that's a better gold price than silver price. We're at 1431 silver. That's a silver price that, that is really, I mean, the silver mining stocks are bad. Even first majestic silver's chart looks really ugly. Which one did I see? Which one? Oh, let's just take a look really quick. Endeavor Silver is below two dollars a share at a dollar eighty six. Freaking crazy. Coeur d'Alene's at four dollars a share. Given their history of reverse stock splits, if that stock goes lower, maybe they reverse it again. Although they have they had massive losses in the last quarter, last month that they announced. Hecla is down to two dollars fifty nine cents a share. I mean these are these are these were actual businesses, right? And these are penny stocks now. <laughs> these are basically penny stocks now. A lot of these and they're actual businesses so basically the the stocks are being priced almost like bankruptcy already I, almost and if you understand how the stock market works if your share price on a lot of stocks is below five dollars a share pension a lot of pension funds and mutual funds by their bylaws aren't allowed to hold the stock I was looking at SSR mining, which is what Silver Standard used to be, and they wouldn't even report all in sustaining costs. They're claiming to have all this free cash flow, and they wouldn't even report. I looked through all their financial statements and their uh, investors' presentations, and they wouldn't even report any all in sustaining costs. It was only cash costs. I think that's a red flag, but they're, the market doesn't seem to care about that right now, and the market uh, is giving them the benefit of the doubt at a higher like valuation and share price than other miners. Okay, so let's talk about the dollar. Dollar index is at 96.84. So I don't see any evidence yet that the dollar rally is over. In fact, if there's more problems in emerging markets, if there's more problem, if China gets worse, if European banks blow up, if European governments have problems, that would temporarily probably continue the dollar rally, maybe even accelerate it. But I think Brent Johnson, if you're familiar with Brent Johnson's work, he has a pretty good argument. I don't agree with everything he said, but I he actually thinks all the miners are going bankrupt. So I don't know if that's going to happen, but I don't. Uh, I do agree with a good amount of his stuff about the dollar rally, and he has been right since since March with his milkshake theory. No, Dave, you said precious metals are never coming back. They will come back eventually. I mean, okay, so here's the funny thing, Dave. The actual data on physical demand is really good. If Check out Lewis Camerson on other people's data. The data for physical demand for silver, for gold out of India and China is actually very strong. But the, it doesn't affect the paper price, and that's because of the dislocation in the markets. But you know what? As I've said this, people have to focus on the supply. If the miners go bust and the demand for the metal is still strong, you're get, the dislocation is going to have to correct itself. Oh, I'm only looking at Kiss, excuse me. I'm only looking at Kiko for the price. I know people buy on uh, buy there, and they have like. 
some type of paper bullion trading. Yeah, I'm not involved in that stuff. I only go there for the price of gold and silver. They have charts and stuff. That's it. I would not advocate buying any metal from Kitco. Let's just put it that way. Actually, based on how gold money traded me, I'm not sure I would buy any from there either. Although they have a good product to use back and forth in trading gold, but they did screw me over really, really badly on an advertising deal. If I had more money, I would sue them. Let's just put it that way. Okay, so a couple more things and we'll get to listener Q&A and we'll wrap, we'll wrap up the show. Dan Bongino, I saw a really interesting speech from him. He just put out a book about Spygate. And basically, like, I, if you really want to understand some of the stuff that's going on, it is crazy. He basically shows that how the guy from Fusion GPS and his wife have been touting the same narrative and story for like 10 years. That they wrote a Wall Street Journal article about this case for the, sp for, you know, Russian spying. They wrote it 10 years ago. And had different names. And then they just crossed out the names that they had and put in the new guys to get in trouble to go after Trump. <laughs> you you really have to read the book and the citations to believe this stuff. Mr. Freeze, Las Vegas casino stocks, good or bad? Well, if the Chinese economy is not doing well, then Chinese probably will not come to Vegas to gamble. There will be Californians that go to Vegas, but a lot of them, my friends who go to California, uh, from California to Vegas all the time, they don't gamble. They go there to party. So I don't know. I, I, it, if the economy gets worse, Mr. Freeze, I don't think, in my opinion, that casino stocks will be good. In fact, I believe casino stocks, a lot of them crashed even far more than a lot of other stocks in 2008. Okay, so I'm going to go. I think I've covered pretty much all the points I want to cover here. Yeah, if you want to do your own due diligence and your own research, there are a lot of screw-ups by the rating agencies on AAA-rated corporations on keeping that AAA credit rating and allowing the corporation to hang itself in the long run with more and more debt. For either share buybacks with more debt, we're approaching almost $5 trillion total in share buybacks, or leveraged mergers and acquisitions where the cash flows, the earnings that were promised in order to do to borrow more debt to do the acquisition have not come to fruition. So I can't give you an exact time frame, but the ratings agencies, when this all does blow up, and this is another one of those economic landmines, a very big one, the ratings agencies do deserve blame. I don't think the mainstream financial media will blame them. Now that you've listened to this and you're probably going to go out there and re read articles and research this, they, you know now the truth that just like in the, uh, the housing bubble and the mortgage-backed security crisis with the rating agencies rubber stamping stuff as AAA, the rating agencies are complicit again to collect fees. Okay, so let's get to listener questions now. Black Swan, you want to know what the canary in the coal mine is? I would say the canary in the coal mine to watch is watch the dollar index and watch the 10-year treasury yield. So right now, the 10-year treasury yield is, it's been knocked back down, I think, to three, around 3.05. So what that tells me is that despite all these credit bubbles and problems, that money is coming back into the United States still, and it's not going into stocks or money is leaving stocks maybe institutional money hedge funds are selling stocks on rallies and they're moving that money into cash, into dollars, and also into 10-year into treasuries. But what's interesting though is that the 30-year U.S. Treasury, the yield is kind of flat. So despite the Fed comments, I don't think that the 30-year Treasury yield has moved very much. It's the 10-year though that it was about to break out. I think only two weeks ago, it was uh, above 3.25% it had closed once and then it got whacked back down and now it's at 3.05 again. So if m my thesis is that either the banks, the large US banks and Victor Sperandio said this, the large US banks, and we know because data has been released on this, the large US banks own over $200 billion. They may own more than that off balance sheet or stuck in other accounts, but they own at least a couple hundred billion dollars worth of US treasuries. 
So the large U.S. banks can come in and they can help that uh, tenure, keep it in a trading range from blowing out. So I would watch the 10-year treasury. I would watch the dollar index. The oil price this low is a bad sign. At this oil price being this low, the oil services companies like Schlumberger, Halliburton, War, uh, what's the other, Weatherford, I think there's a couple others. Bigger use got bought by GE, but maybe GE has to sell the entire company soon. Those companies will lose, if the oil price doesn't rebound, they will lose a lot of business. Because we're in an oil price with a you know 30% drop in a month. We're down to, let me look at the oil price right now. We're at $50.60 WTI, 59.26 Brent. So the Malaysian government said uh, their national oil company Petronas would be, their government would be in enormous financial problems if Brent crude dropped below 70. So we're $10, more than $10 below 70 on Brent. And WTI, most people aren't aware of this unless you know a lot about the oil market, but shale oil and also Canadian oil sands sells at a big, big discount to WTI. So it sells for even cheaper than 50 now. So shale oil always sells for a discount to WTI and Canadian oil sells at an even bigger discount to WTI. So we're at like out in the oil field and then you have to factor in all the costs with transportation costs and stuff. We're at a lower oil price in the real world than the WTI price for certain types of oil. It's bad. So if you're, unless you're hedged for a couple years out, maybe hope if, if you're an oil producer or shale producer, if you're hedged for a couple years out and the oil price rallies, you're okay. If your balance sheet's okay. But if the oil price stays at these levels for a while, the oil service companies that do the drilling and handle that, they're going to lose a lot of orders. The deep water offshore drillers like uh, Transocean, their chart looked really, really bad. They're going to be in trouble. Even the higher cost oil producers, deep water like Petrobras. I think that stock, I forgot what it was. I can look it up real quick. Petrobras had a had way over borrowed. Their Brazilian government with the corruption, they're always in corruption scandals with Petrobras. I could see big, big problems with Petrobras. Petrobras has actually rallied pretty strongly. So maybe they have cleaned things up there. I could see Petrobras, if the oil price doesn't recover, I could see Petrobras start having big, big problems. Shockingly, Petrobras has actually rallied quite a bit this year. Especially since, uh, looks like June. Yeah, it went down to, down to nine something, and now it's up to 14. 14 something. I, let, let's just say this is not financial advice, but I could see Petrobras back down to nine something fairly quickly. Just my opinion, not not financial advice. Not managing any money. Okay, let me look at some more listener questions. Are our rates are rates are still low? Well, this is what's happened is a lot of people, whether it was corporations or governments, banks, hedge funds, they all took advantage of those low rates. They did financial engineering. The corporations did leverage mergers and acquisitions with not earnings with EBITDA, selling that to the ratings agencies, and then they've done share buybacks with debt. And so, you know, these corporate C first of all, for, for General Electric, the previous CEOs, Jack Welch, everyone loves that guy. The problem started with him. Okay, the problem started with Jack Welch. GE destroyed its brand. They used to have consumer products that everyone recognized, multiple ones of them in everyone's home. They lost that. They started, you know, focusing on different things. If you ask like a younger adult, General Electric, if they know of anything General Electric makes or see anything, I'm not sure if they could tell you. You know, a couple decades ago, there was General Electric light bulbs, General Electric telephones, General Electric appliances. They had their brand, which was very well respected throughout your home, uh, at least middle class homes. And so that went away. And so they destroyed their brand. And there's tons of value investors saying that, oh, General Electric's going to turn it around. Um, you know, the new CEO is going to fix things. I, I'm not so sure. 
And I think from what I've heard, there's a lot of stuff off balance sheet. And they're relying on the bank, the, the bankers to be nice and not call in loans and maybe even give them more credit on the revolving credit facility. There's a lot of things that need to go right for General Electric to turn things around, let's just say. I think GE over decades has destroyed their brand. It started with Jack Welch. People were applauding him and saying he was one of the best CEOs of all time. Guy was doing financial engineering back then. Jeff Immelt, his successor, was even was so much worse. Guy paid himself like over $100 million, golden parachute, when he should probably be in prison soon. And what's worse is the General Electric employees. They're the pension, they're the General Electric pension fund. One of the main holdings is General Electric stock. So if General Electric goes bust, the pension fund goes bust too. And then the employees get fired on top of that probably. And you know what? General Electric's not, over the next five or ten years, I'm confident General Electric's not going to be the only company where this happens. And then none of the corporate executives that pocketed over $100 million and knew that their company would eventually blow up 5, 10, 15 years from now are going to go to jail for it. I don't even know if they'll get sued. And then people are going to blame capitalism for everything. Ugh. Okay, so I'll stop my rant. Let me look at more uh, listener comments and questions. DD, stock market is up, so everything is fine. It's like the Lego movie, right? Everything is awesome. There's actually the really good uh, economic cartoon with Janet Yellen as the fairy saying everything is awesome. I did a short video, a little short video on this a couple years ago with that that uh, economic cartoon, and then I played the Lego song uh, at the end of the video. It was kind of funny. Everything is not fine. E even if the... This is kind of, like I said, this financial his history perspective reminds me of the last couple years before October 29, 1929, Black Tuesday, that there was tons and tons. Of, first of all, almost every other stock market in the world, DD, is in a bear market. It's below its 50 and 200 day moving averages. And so the rest of the world's been in a recession or a depression for at least a year now. But the U.S. stock market was doing well and Trump and other people were selling that the U.S. had an enormous recovery. Anecdotally, I've heard other stories, crazy stories about like lack of jobs. One of my sister's friends works at like a company, uh, I forget what type of company, and they were trying to hire, like it's not even a financial company, they're trying to hire one entry-level financial analyst in one of their departments, and supposedly for an entry-level job, they got over 500 applications in a very short amount of time. So if the economy was doing well, I'm not sure that would be happening. Now, that doesn't disprove the government economic data, but if you have tons of examples of that, anecdotally, it would. DD, I, I still think they wanted a correction in stocks. I still think the Federal Reserve wanted a correction in stocks from a lot of their reporting, but I think now they're worried because some of those major stocks have already cracked 20%. Like the FANG stocks have basically been defanged. Facebook, Facebook has a credibility problem. So Facebook may have revenues and earnings, but I know tons of people in the United States who have deactivated their Facebook account, who don't trust Facebook. And you know what? That's, if ever, they may never be able to repair their reputation and credibility with those people. It'll either take a long time or it won't happen at all. So there's real, real problems. Well, the the uh, Cyber Monday and Black Friday and all those shopping numbers, I don't think the actual bricks and mortar retail were doing as well as expected, but the online shopping e-commerce stuff was up a lot. But that will hurt. That will hurt, you know, the, the mall rits, the commercial retail mall rits. That will eventually hurt them if the shopping numbers for physical stores are not good. We're not going to find those out, all of those out for a while, though. But the initial reports out of Black Tuesday, uh, excuse me, not Black Tuesday, out of Black Friday and Cyber Monday and all the, you know, uh, buy now sales, the discounting, the discounting didn't increase massively. At some places it did, but I was looking at overall averages and the discounting for a lot of retailers did not uh, increase massively. 
I thought it might, but it didn't. At least that's what I saw in the articles in the last couple days. RR, is Fed going to stop hiking? Well, they may slow it down. They were supposed to hike soon in December, and then they were supposed to hike, I think, four times next year, three or four times next year. They may not do that. They may only do it once or something. Because remember, I talked about this in the last live stream show that for either I think former Federal Reserve Bank president at Minneapolis, Neil Kashkari, also that guy also worked at Goldman Sachs and a politician, but he was writing op eds a couple weeks ago saying that the rate hikes need to stop any more rate hikes and it will crash everything. So it looks like they are taking heed. Now, remember, and this is one thing I actually like about Trump. Trump has flipped. He's now blaming the Fed for stuff. After taking credit for the stock market rise during the 2000, uh, after he won the election in 2016 for the last two years or so, after taking credit for the stock market rally, now that things are cracking, now he's blaming the Fed. He's placing the blame at the Fed where it should be. The Fed deserves, the Fed and the other central banks deserve an enormous amount of the blame for all this. Now, they don't deserve all the blame for the corporate bond bubble and corporate debt problems because, like I said, the rating agencies are involved in this too. The banks are involved in this. The banks have forced the I, I don't know if force is the right word. The banks have cajoled, in, the banks have pressured a lot of people to borrow, like governments and corporations that probably shouldn't have borrowed. So there's blame to go around. But like 2008, unfortunately, I don't know if anyone's actually going to go to prison for it because I really don't. Maybe the new attorney general that Trump puts in will restore a rule of law. Sounds like the guy may be pro-marijuana if it's Whitaker. Actually, almost anyone other than Sessions will probably be pro-marijuana. <laughs> as, as I've said in the past, Jeff Sessions basically is Mr. Reefer Madness. You know that QAnon stuff? That QAnon stuff, people still tell me that QAnon's right. I mean, the QAnon stuff, I know people. some people are going to be angry at me for this, but saying that Je that QAnon was doing a good job, uh, excuse me, saying that Jeff Sessions was doing a good job, that that was part of the plan for Sessions to look inept and run interference. <laughs> the, the, the attorney in Utah that's supposedly running the secret investigation, the federal attorney in Utah, supposedly he... So a lot of the people that he was supposed to have interviewed, he has not interviewed in the year or whatever that he's been running this investigation. They said they haven't been contacted. Now, maybe they're lying in public about it. Maybe they're going on TV or, or on social media and saying that they were never contacted. But pretty much all the people that the guy was supposed to have spoken to and interviewed, they said that they haven't been contacted. So I think a lot of the QAnon stuff is total BS. I think it's speculation. Or it's controlled opposition. Intentional head fakes. What's an or Wendell? What's an orange swan? Is that Donald Trump? What's an orange swan? Are are things well? Not everything's breaking. Restaurants and retail haven't broken yet. But yes, energy, oil has broken. Nat natural gas has had a big rally, but if everything crashes, I don't know if natural gas is going to keep rallying. So there may be bargains to go back in and buy on the long, again, not financial advice, but there may be some really good bargains for natural gas. If, if everything does crash, that would be good purchases. Natural gas stuff that's already gone up that you can go back in and buy. Miser, bonds, dating on bonds depends. It, bond dating is different. Not all bonds have the same dates. You have to go in and look. And sometimes the corporation can get stuff extended. So if they pay a certain amount up front, an extra amount up front, they can take off a chunk of the principal and then they can get, they can change the maturity on the bond or negotiate a different interest rate. But some of these bonds may not be fixed interest rates that some of these corporations have. Some of them may be variable rate borrowing. And if interest rates spike, that would get them in trouble. Again, you would have to, not financial advice, but if you want to learn to do research on your own, you'd have to go in there and read the annual reports of the company with the disclosures on credit risk. And it'll, it should say somewhere in the annual reports listing the bonds, how much debt they have, 
um, when the debt is due, how much, so for example, you know, it might say like if a, if a company has like $10 billion in debt, we owe $3 billion at, I don't know, 5% due in five years. And then, you know, uh, the rest of the money is due in eight years or 10 years at a different interest rate. So you have to learn to go through the documents and see. A lot of that type of information may not easily be able to be found, especially if the company's in trouble. Normally, they're going to hide it. General Electric was not going around telling people, sending out press releases for the last 10, 15, 20 years that, the, that they were paying fines to the SEC for accounting fraud and other and accounting restatements and all that stuff. When, uh, Wendell, the Sandstorm Gold share buybacks is with free cash flow, not with debt. If they do use any debt, that's that would be from a revolving credit facility, which is undrawn. They did do remember a revolving. Uh, they did borrow around fifty million dollars for the Hyundai royalty deal, and they paid. That was from the revolving credit facility, so they used debt for that. But they got immediate cash flow in that deal and an enormous amount of exploration upside. The uh, carry pump part of the land, I'm going to interview Nolan Watson later this week. And the carry pump, they just announced this, it's on their Twitter, uh, because the counterparty there, Endeavor Mining, they were drilling the carry pump part on the Hyundai Royalty. So they think they have a deposit there, and they just announced a resource estimate, and they have found another million ounces of indicated gold that they're going to drill more off of. And Sandstorm's royalty covers, the land covers 80% of the new million ounce gold deposit. So that's not immediate cash flow, but Sandstorm used the credit facility, about $50 million of their credit facility and debt, to add a deal for immediate cash flow, and they already paid off the debt. So I would say that that's a smart way to use debt strategically. You don't use too much debt. You have cash flow to cover the debt. You pay it back. You add another asset. You have that gives you more cash flow. That would be like what a real estate investor would do with rental properties. And the share buybacks, the share buybacks are not with debt. They're with cash flow, free cash flow. And that's because I think a lot of the deals right now, there's a lot of bad mining counterparties out there. We are at uh, the copper price yesterday was two dollars seventy one cents. I think it rallied a little bit today to two dollars seventy eight cents a pound. That's a low copper price, and I know uh, I've heard a lot of rumors that these uh, primary copper miners, base metal miners, are looking to sell gold streams and copper streams. The problem is the counterparty is bad, so they're not low cost producers. They have bad balance sheets. So if you buy a gold stream or a silver stream from a copper miner or base metal miner and the mining company goes bust, it's, the deal will go bad. It, if it's not a low-cost producer, they have a bad balance sheet, too much debt, and their costs aren't, aren't low enough. So you have a situation now in the copper market. Not only is silver really the silver price really low, but the copper price is not also really low. Uh, when Rick Rule was on a couple months ago on my show for an interview, he said that the lowest cost, the largest lowest-cost copper miners produce around $2.50 a pound. And... Normally, copper miners are hedged, but we're at a copper price now that's not too much higher than the lowest cost producer. So that tells me the copper miners are going to be in trouble in the near future, too. So uh, the reason I brought up copper and silver and new deals and stuff is that Sandstorm Gold, they have cash flow coming in. They were looking at, well, should we do a new deal? Should we hold cash in our balance sheet? Their stock is cheap. It's at a 52-week low. So Sandstorm Gold has enormous revenue growth coming online on, in January. So they're going to be buying back shares with free cash flow, plus they have revenue growth coming online with the Cerro Moro Silver Stream and the Arizona Royalty Restart from Ross Beatty's co uh, gold company. Equinox Gold. So th those are going to be two new sources of revenue coming online in January. Those mines, uh, Cerro Moro is already up and running economically, and Arizona is almost done with the construction and restarting. So it's good to have options. Now, maybe if a deal comes along, Sandstorm may uh, temporarily halt the share buyback, but I think if your stock's at 52-week low and you have cash flow and you think your company is cheap, using free cash flow to buy back your stock, plus you have revenue growth coming online soon, I think that's good for shareholders. It's better than paying a dividend now.
is better than starting a dividend in a bear market. The gold miners are still in a bear market. Look at the share prices. All the share prices for all the gold miners are down except for like a handful. Only what Kirkland Lake Gold, West Elm Gold, very few other gold miners are doing well right now. What's Franco Nevada at? Let me see real quick. Yeah, I mean, Franco Nevada is down to 68. That's, let me see what valuation it's at. I mean, Franco Nevada is really quality. That's the safest gold company on earth right now. FNV. Frank Neal Violet. RR buybacks used to be illegal. I don't know if they should be illegal, but I mean, the amount of debt that's been used, RR, is just insane. There's no way. This doesn't make any sense where a company did not grow revenues, did not grow earnings, did not free cash, did not grow free cash flow, and yet the more debt they borrow, their credit rating is unchanged. And this, like I said, the central banks deserve an enormous amount of blame. The the large banks deserve a large amount of blame, but the credit rating agencies deserve a lot of blame too. Okay? Because this should have been taken care of. There's no way these blue chip, and I'm using air quote companies, should have been allowed to borrow billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars while maintaining the same credit rating. So this is an accident waiting to happen, a bug look in search of a windshield. I just don't know the exact time frame on this. If you do your own research and due diligence, you could probably find some of these companies and get a rough estimate, a better rough estimate. But there's a lot of them in the next five or 10 years that will have problems. I don't know if all of them are gonna go bankrupt, but they're gonna be in situations similar to GE. Government Motors. Well, Robert, you know, GM did get a bailout. They are Government Motors. I think that's a funny name. A lot of auto companies in a lot of countries are subsidized. So they're actually jobs programs. Most people aren't aware of this. So in South Korea, a lot of the auto companies actually are unprofitable. So they produce cars, sell them here in the U.S. They're not tariffed or taxed heavily. And they actually, a lot of the South Korean auto companies run in enormous losses. And if you follow the history of Toyota, now Toyota is a very profitable company now. But for the first couple decades of Toyota manufacturing cars and pickup trucks, they ran into enormous losses. They were totally subsidized by the Japanese government. So technically, I would say almost all the auto companies, almost a lot of them are government motors. I don't know how old you are, Robert, but even I remember when I was a little kid that a lot of people didn't want Toyotas and that they were like really, they were considered, the American consumer considered them very dangerous. They were lemons. They made bad, cheap, dirty pickup trucks and really tiny, dirty, shitty, um, you know, small cars. Not that anyone can make a profit anymore of small cars because like I said, a lot of, a lot of uh, government car companies are producing them either break even or at a loss and flooding the American market with them. And you're seeing General Motors and you're also seeing Ford that they can't make a profit on small cars. Not, o not only do a lot of consumers not want small cars here in the U.S., but also like you have these countries that basically keep their workers employed to produce cars for jobs programs, and they flood the U.S. market with them, and they don't care if they make a profit. Philip Waldron, all commodities going higher will reverse. I don't know if all commodities will go higher. Uh, I think in the short term, Philip, I think the dollar may continue to go higher. Now, eventually, that will ha that will have to change. But in the short term, I don't see any evidence that the dollar rally is over. You have to look at the dollar index. You'd have to see a big drop in the dollar index. The dollar index would have to go you know, below 93 or 92 again pretty quickly and have to close her a, quite a lot in a, many days in a row and right now it looks fill up like the dollar index we're at I forgot the dollar index 
Let me go back to Yahoo Finance real quick. We're at 96.73. The dollar index has been above 97 a couple times. It hasn't closed above 97 strongly a lot yet, but it there's not an enormous amount of overhead, at least on the long-term charts. There's not a lot of overhead resistance at 97 on the do long-term dollar index charts. So I think the dollar index will ultimately get through the 97 resistance, close above there quite a, uh, in the near future, maybe as soon as a couple weeks, and then move to 98. The scary part for me, as I've said in past short videos and past live streams, is if the dollar index gets to 100 or 102 and breaks through those overhead resistances. That will signal to me that things are getting out of control, especially 102. Because if the dollar index gaps up above 102, it could go really, really quickly a lot higher than 102. And that would be like, that would be like collapse. That would signal to me collapse in some other emerging markets, either governments, emerging market governments, emerging market banks, emerging market corporations. There is way too much dollar denominated debt outstanding. And actually a lot of it's in China. Most people aren't aware of this. You know, all, a lot of the gold community, a lot of the alternative media is not aware of the problems in China and how much dollar-denominated debt the, the Chinese corporations has uh, outstanding now and Chinese state-owned enterprises. And then we have housing bubbles popping. So we have housing bubble in Australia popping. Uh, the U.S. housing is slowing down a lot. I haven't seen, uh, so Home Depot and Lowe's, the home, uh, home renovation construction retail stores have not, those charts have not broken yet, but the housing market continues lower in the U.S. I could see those cracking too. Yeah, yeah, Miser, Cocaine Larry. Well, remember, he used to talk about green shoots every day. He would look through like, piles and piles of negative economic information to find the one golden straw or green shoot of positive economic information anything he could on a show that's when i was just waking up so i was like what the hell is this guy doing i wonder if he's still on, still on the juice though on the yay he claims to be clean but i don't know the way he acts Maybe he's just crazy. Okay, guys. Well, we're getting kind of late. There's a ton of other comments coming through. I don't have time to answer them all. I am tired. I want to go try out a new show on Netflix. What's called Babylon Berlin in English subtitles. It's about Germany during the Weimar, Weimar Republic. We do have German listeners. They will get angry for me saying Weimar Republic. Weimar Republic. Weimar Republic. Heard they spent a lot of money on the show. It sounds pretty interesting. Check out a couple episodes. Everyone have a nice week. Uh, I do have an interview with Nolan Watson later in the week scheduled for now. And uh, that'll probably be good insights into the gold mining industry. I think his company is doing really, really good things right now from an operational standpoint. The share price is looking pretty decent too. It's been moving up on the announcement of that share buyback. And then on top of that, like I said, there's there. How many other gold companies have big revenue increases coming already in January? Uh, in only uh, six weeks away. So I think big things are coming for Sandstorm Gold. Again, not financial advice, but I think you know 2019, 2020, their growth is going to really explode. Okay, guys, that's it for now. Everyone have a nice night and a good rest of your week. Okay, bye.